Hi, and welcome to Stressed, the podcast to develop your stress resilience. Being ambitious and successful while living a happy life is possible. Learn how you can better cope with stress in day-to-day -day situations by applying tools and techniques that work for you. My name is Julia Arndt, and I'm extremely grateful that you decided to check out my podcast today. Let's get started. Hi, Luke. I'm super excited to have you on the podcast today. How are you? Morning, Julia. I'm great. I'm happy to be a part of it. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit more about um, what's going on right now. Where are you located and what time is it and what have you been up to this morning? So my name is Lucas Dunham. I'm a performance coach for Exos and I'm working currently at Google headquarters. So I operate a fitness center. Um, I offer a lot of small group training classes here and I work individually with a lot of clientele at Google. Yeah, great. And so you are located in Mountain View, Sunnyvale area in the Bay Area, right? Yep. Yeah, I'm in the South Bay Area and I'm yeah, located in Sunnyvale at the moment. Nice. And um, what, has, what does your mornings look like? So it's 9.40 now for both of us because we're both located in California. Um, what, what have you been up to this morning? So this morning, um, I started off with some personal training. I, I do some personal training outside of Google. Uh, so I work with a few clients in the mornings before work, but just getting into work now, basically just making sure the, fit, the fitness center is up and running. And I've got a handful of classes that are scheduled throughout the rest of the day that I'm preparing for. Okay. And do you have a morning routine for yourself before you're starting to coach other people? What does that look like for you? I do. Yeah, I do. I, I like to uh, introduce a little bit of light movement. I find that that's the easiest way for me to clear my head and to come in very open and willing to be fluid and willing to learn in the training sessions. Mm -hmm. I find like most jobs, if I come in with a, a preset expectation of the way things need to be, um, oftentimes life reminds me that it's not going to work out exactly the way I think. So I like to take a few moments specifically right before a training session Uh, to just move, to focus on exhaling fully. Um, and just, like I said, a little bit of light movement is a great way to kind of get my mind right before. Mm -hmm. Nice. Great. So I invited you to the podcast um, today specifically because I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the common pitfalls of the holiday season and what kind of obstacles you see as a performance coach, um, you know, kind of, especially towards the end of the year with both physical and mental well-being and health? It's definitely a hot topic for myself and my clients lately. Yeah. Um, just a bit of background. I, I work with about 400 unique people a year, so I, I get the chance to influence a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, the, you know, how, do I, how do I keep my routine going during the holiday season is a question that I get all the time. Mm -hmm. But in regards to specific pitfalls, there's a couple major ones that stick out to me. I think... Um, One is just uh, catastrophizing uh, weight gain or the lack of a routine. I think when, around the holiday season, if we're eating a lot of inflammatory foods, you think sweets or gravies or you know big carbohydrate dishes, it's not unlikely to for us to see a, a quick spike in weight gain. And a lot of times that's just retention of water and a lot of other factors going into that. But mm -hmm. a lot of times folks uh, see that and It, it becomes a very big deal in our head. And we think, oh man, I gained all this weight immediately. And all of a sudden it starts to catastrophize us. Um, now I, I need to work extra hard to, to lose this weight. Or I need to really come back in and hit as hard as I can. So I think the biggest, one of the biggest pitfalls I see is just um, focusing a little bit too much on the negative effects of the holiday and not, not spending enough time being present with your family and doing the things that you love around that time of the year. Mm -hmm. um, another major one is... Uh, It's simple, but just the lack of playing. I think a lot of times, even if it's just in a training session in the gym or playing outside or doing different activities along, along the holidays, the weather is usually not the most cooperative to being outside and playing. And a lot of times, you know, we're in a social environment where we're hanging with our family and our friends and spend a lot of time stagnant sitting and talking. So I think just the lack of playing in general is another big one that we see uh, specifically around the holiday season. Mm -hmm. Um, last I love one that is, actually that's a really interesting point so would you say that you know people are like when you're in like your family setting you just should motivate everyone to go out for a walk <laughs> or something like that <laughs> I, I definitely try to do that um, I also just try to spend time at the kids table I find whatever little kids or my little cousins are around and 
try yeah. to follow them around for a little bit. And I find just trying to keep up with them feels like exercise in itself. <laughs> yeah. Um, but sometimes when I put on my, my adult cap and I sit over with the adults, I find myself really not moving around very much. So mm-hmm. I think that there's definitely a lot we can learn from kids around the holiday season of just being blissful and playing. And there's going to be uh, an exercise component to that. But I think the last one is kind of a result of the first two. And it, that's that big loss of motivation. Mm-hmm. When we see, when we see a, a spike, spike in weight or we, you know, we're away from our normal routines in the gyms or in running, a lot of times those things start to build off of each other. And then we, we ultimately find this big loss of motivation of like, you know what, screw it. I, I'm already in this far. I might as well just indulge completely. And we see almost like a, a cognitive, um, almost just like an overindulgence during the holiday season as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, I, I like that fact as well. And then it's also like, and I'm talking a lot about this at the moment as well. It's okay. I've created these really like kind of difficult new habits maybe in 2019, right? Like I, I started to lose weight. Maybe I started to get into a more regular workout routine, no matter if it's going to the gym or going for a run or being just more active in general. And then towards the end of the year, you're just getting so stressed with all these other things, especially at work. And I'm sure that you probably see that as well. I'm curious to hear more about that um, as a coach working at Google um, and seeing basically the people um, maybe coming less to the gym. I don't know if you can tell. But it's always like you have worked so hard to create this habit over the whole year. Like if you let this slip now, then it's not like it's not not for nothing, but it's definitely a shame to let that kind of go again, right? Yeah, I think another big part of it is it almost feels a little bit selfish in a busy time to want to spend time and investing time and getting better ourselves. Mm. So if you're a family member, if you have a big team at work, if you manage people, a lot of times it, we're so foc- hyper-focused on serving those people that mm-hmm. we take that, that time that we would normally be investing in ourselves feels almost that much more selfish. And that tends to be the first thing we put on the back burner. So the end of the quarter, the end of the year coming up, a lot of expectations for your family. A lot of times we see all these things as higher priorities than our own personal time investment. Mm-hmm. Um, but I try to remind people that if you want to be the best servant either to your family or to your team at work or to your social group that it starts with you being the best version of yourself. So if you're spending time, even if it's a couple hours a week, investing time into getting better, then you can ultimately be a better parent or better friend, a better colleague at work as well. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. I think it's very important. Yeah. I think that, like I said, it's just with the, with the workload increasing and then with social um, responsibilities and family responsibilities increasing. Um, I definitely see a drop in attendance and a lot of people going to the gym at Google and just in general, I see a lot of times, uh, that those few hours a week that we hold so preciously throughout the rest of the year somehow slips through the cracks at the end of the year. And it just kind of feeds into these other problems that I already addressed of, you know, catastrophizing change and lack of a routine. Mm -hmm. So my, my suggestion for folks is, to have realistic routines and almost easy to attain routines. So something really simple like, hey, I'm gonna be in the gym twice this week. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna make sure that I'm in there for at least two sessions of 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that seems like a pretty attainable one. So I I tell folks to maybe not reach as far as I normally would reach throughout the rest of the year and just find something that they can easily stick to uh, as things start to pick up and get busier towards the end of the year. Yeah, I love that. And I think this is always the the very most difficult thing, right? It's like going into the gym or doing or maybe putting on your shoes or whatever it is. But then once you do it, you usually probably spend even more time than that in the gym or or working out because you actually start feeling good about yourself and you're enjoying it. And um, hopefully, you know, that that kind of um, goal just gets you gets you started. And then hopefully, you know, you will see the benefits of it and that you will you will kind of continue doing it regularly as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so you were saying that, you know, you have a lot of conversations at the moment and with people about, you know, those (laughs) that about exactly that topic about kind of how do I stick to my routine? um, What, what other things are people coming to with you, to you right now and ask about? I also try to, to set the stage that sometimes taking a break from movement and taking a break from hard routines of nutrition doesn't necessarily guarantee that there's going to be a weight increase. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I ask people like, Hey, 
have you paid attention to your weight at all on times that you've gone on vacation? Mm-hmm. A couple of people say, yeah, you know, yeah, I haven't really paid attention to it. Then I always get a few people that say, hey, you know what? Now that you bring that up, I actually found that the last time I went on vacation, I lost three or four pounds when I came back. Mm-hmm. And then somebody else will chime in and say, hey, yeah, I was actually really surprised. I thought for sure I was going to gain weight because I was on the beach, I was eating, and then I came back and I weighed less. So I like to kind of plant the seed and get people thinking about, all right, what? why did that happen? Why would I lose weight on a vacation when I was out of my routine? And a lot of times they just start to put the pieces together and realize like that taking themselves out of a stressful situation and just being able to relax and play and mm-hmm. hang out and socialize, that because they've now down-regulated stress, they've been able to respond to a lot of the stimulus that they've been getting in weeks prior to that. So I also try to just float it out there that just because you're taking a time away from working out doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be gaining weight. And it might actually be the case that this decreased stress may actually help you get in the direction that you want to go in terms of your health and fitness. Yeah, absolutely. There's a couple of things that I want to talk about there. So, and you said it multiple times already now, I think really being intentional and aware makes a huge difference. So even like as an adult being intentional about, I'm just going to play with um, my, my little cousins now, because that's making me move or, you know, inviting people to go outside as a way to be intentional about like paying attention to yourself and moving and getting some movement goals in <laughs> even during the holiday. And then as well of being intentional about, Hey, okay. Um, I'm, I'm just catastrophizing and I'm freaking out because I haven't done that normal routine that I'm usually doing when I'm at work, but okay. When I'm actually paying attention to this, like I am, um, gain, losing weight during the holidays or during a vacation because, um, I'm just taking care of myself and my stress levels actually decrease, which I'm sure you have read all these studies about, you know, how stress also impacts weight gain, um, because we are constantly in the fight and flight response and we are not digesting maybe the foods as we're supposed to be digesting or eating more sugary foods or like quick things because we just need to get going or keep going and yeah there's all these different parts of of the puzzle yeah i find that the i I mean i I think that this is a very blanket statement but i feel like the the body has like a finite amount of ability to respond to stress Mm -hmm. and if people want to get stronger, they want to lose weight, they want to change their body composition, even though those things in the big picture are healthy, any disruption of homeostasis in a way is stressful. So even if that's me losing body fat, in a way that's still going to be stressful because it's a change to my normal sense of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So if I want to have available resources, I like the analogy of a, a cup. If I want to be able to pour some out of my cup to change my body composition, change my health, I need to make sure that cup stays full. And if I'm constantly responding to stress at work and I'm constantly stressing out about stress, my cup's almost empty, right? And I have very, very few resources available left to get the changes that I want to change in my body. So mm-hmm. I think that's a big part is people just realize when they're on the holidays or on vacation, now all of a sudden they've got a full cup and they've got all these uh, resources available to respond. Um, so I, I just remind folks that this decreased time of stress may actually be more beneficial than you continuing to tax your body and stress your body in the way that you are currently. Mm, Really nice. Okay. And we were talking a little bit about kind of sticking to routines or why it is so important um, to keep the habits going. And I think one of the things that you already said that I found super powerful is that make it a really realistic goals during that time. So if you are, if you know that you're super stressed, you're traveling, you need to see your family, buy all of the gifts, like all these different things, just create something really realistic on your calendar. Is there anything else that you tell people to think about or do? Yeah, there's, there's two big ones that I personally find very helpful and that I, I find very easily attainable. Um, one is just a 10 minute walk after any large meal. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be after any snack, but you know, assuming you have two or three big meals a day when you're with your family on the holidays, implementing a 10 minute walk right after I not even necessarily for long-term health. Yes. It's going to be beneficial for long-term health, but I, I like to frame it as like to avoid that feeling of you're going to fall asleep at four o'clock on the couch. Cause I know every time I, with the holidays, especially if there's any alcohol involved, I look around and I see most of my family like snoozing on the couch in the late afternoon. Yeah. And I, I want to be able to spend, I'm only only home with my family for a certain amount of time and I want to be able to optimize the amount of time we get to socialize and hang out. So 
mainly just to avoid people falling asleep really early. I like to get them riled up and like, hey, let's go for a walk. Let's walk around a little bit after food. And I find that most people feel like, wow, oh, I don't feel as full or I feel like I've digested a little bit more. I feel like I have more energy. So an easy one is like we talked about, just getting a small walk in, a brisk walk after a meal. And that's just going to help with the digestion process. Mm -hmm. The other one is uh, taking time to eat mindfully and appreciate the food. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people spend so much time crafting beautiful dishes, making these very delicious treats that we get to enjoy around the holidays. And if I'm, you know, just on my phone crushing the food and not spending the time to appreciate it, not only am I kind of missing out, but I'm also not honoring the food that my family members spend a lot of effort making. So a lot of times if you, if you make the perspective more so about respecting family and honoring the time that your family spent making food, that seems to hit home with people too of, you know what, you're right. These guys did spend a lot of time making this food. I shouldn't just eat it mindlessly really fast. I should take the time to appreciate each bite yeah. and just slowing it down and appreciating it will also just limit how much you're going to eat in one sitting and will help people not feel as guilty and will kind of avoid that uh, catastrophic feeling of man, I just ate three full plates of pie. And now, now what do I do? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm even thinking, I love the idea about going for a 10 minute walk. I, I, what I, like, again, we are talking about kind of being intentional, just being in the kitchen and helping to clear the plates and, you know, washing the dishes or just standing and doing kind of the chores and helping and connecting with your family members that way, I think is a huge sign of appreciation for what they've been doing and helping them out. But I, I really love it, actually, because I don't really like to just sit around after having a heavy meal. I like to move. So, you know, no matter if it is going outside or going in the kitchen and just, you know, doing stuff there, I think could be just a way to, you know, to move and have your food digest a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one other question, and I feel like you talked and touched a little bit upon that already, but I just want to highlight it again, because I think people are oftentimes torn between how do I find a balance between really indulging and not falling into bad habits or like not letting go of the good habits that I have created over the year? Um, what, what do you typically say to your clients about that? Yeah, I think that sometimes the definition of a treat gets lost with our perception changing. I think mm -hmm. just reminding people that a treat is something that you enjoy once in a while, that you really are fully in, in the moment enjoying it rather than just something that becomes like the treat itself shouldn't be the routine, right? I think the, mm -hmm. the appreciation of a treat once in a while is a routine in itself, but sometimes that starts to get lost in translation and it just becomes habit of after every meal, I have a little dessert or after every time I have dinner, then I, it's followed up by this and it starts to become automatic rather than something where it, its spontaneity is almost lost with the routine. So mm -hmm. I think having a routine with movement, having a routine with mindfulness, is very important to, to maintain to some level, even if a simple level throughout the holidays. But I think also on the other side of that coin is remembering that treats and sweets are something that should be a little bit spontaneous and should be fully in, in, uh, experienced and in, embraced in the moment. Um, so that's one thing I, from a nutrition standpoint that I like to remind people of, mm -hmm. but also just to, just to make sure movement continues to stay habitual, especially if you've worked hard, like you said, throughout the rest of the year to build a routine and to get yourself certain progress, even though you might not see a huge decrease in those gains of taking two weeks off from doing anything, psychologically, it starts to feel like you're, you're getting pulled very far from away from the hard work that you've already put in. So, mm -hmm. you know, we could ar probably argue physiologically if there's really much uh, degradation of the progress you've made so far, probably not very much. Um, but psychologically, it tends to feel like we're, we've lost a lot more than we really do. So mm -hmm. even if the even if the routine of movement isn't as important in terms of the actual physiology, just to maintain uh, the psychology that we want people progressing in. I think that's a big part of maintaining a routine too. Mm -hmm. to, so to almost be like, okay, maybe I'm taking a two or three week break from my gym routine um, for the next two or three weeks because I'm going to be traveling and I'm going to be home and uh, maybe I don't have access to a gym, but maintaining the psychology and being like, this is okay. Like I'm, May basically making this decision very um, mindfully that this is okay, but remaining of like, okay, but once I'm back, here we go again, and I'm, I'm motivated and I want to keep doing what I've been doing. 
Yeah, I think that you, that's a great way to sum that up is like being appreciative and mindful of a routine, but not being really hard attached to the routine. Because mm-hmm. the more the more attached someone is to a routine, the more they start to struggle when they're pulled out of a situation where they can keep it going. Mm-hmm. So I think understanding the importance and um, appreciating the process of a routine is important, but yeah. also having the fluidity to, to let it go once in a while and to know that yeah. that course is going to eventually come back on track. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, the other thing I'm thinking about as well is just the flexibility, right? Like sometimes I talk to people and they're like, if I can't, like I haven't been able to work out tonight at 6 p.m. Um, so the whole week is screwed, you know, and I'm like, well, just be flexible. Maybe instead of working out Monday, Wednesday and Friday, but it wasn't possible this week, why don't you just do it Tuesday morning instead? Or, you know, like find find the time when it when it works. Don't don't just say, oh, now it's all out of the window <laughs> because I just couldn't do it at the specific time that I set myself to do, which is basically what you've been saying about like the flexibility piece. Yeah. Yeah. One, one analogy that helps me kind of think about this is um, looking at the changes in values of stock over time. Mm-hmm. I found that folk, folks that buy stock that's not as volatile and they you know, I'm just going to buy this and not even look into it for a while then just have faith that in long term this is going to go up in the way that I want it to. Mm-hmm. Those folks are usually pretty content and not very stressed out. But then you look at day traders, for example, that every single day are checking the status of this thing, if it's going up or down. Mm-hmm. And if we look at just the, the one day view, it's all over the place with peaks and valleys and it doesn't really give us the direction. We're not really sure if it's going up or going the way we want it to. Um, so I like to tell people that if you look at just a one day or a one week glimpse at your progress or at your routine, it's going to have these big ebbs and flows and it's not entirely clear the direction it's going in. But if you're able to to just relax and zoom out and look at the bigger picture, even though there's ebbs and flows, we still see that trajectory going the way we want it to. So I try to remind folks that a routine is important, but we shouldn't be so fixated on uh, evaluating the progress of that routine on a daily basis or that starts to get stressful in itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good point. Especially this the stressful part, right? Because we're already stressing ourselves usually that much with, with work. So if we're putting even more pressure on ourselves, um, kind of leading into our private life, then um, there's no relaxation at all anymore. And that's not healthy either. Yeah. yeah. Um, I always have a couple of questions at the end of the podcast. Um, so I want to kind of start moving into that. Um, what are you most grateful for, Luke? I'm most most grateful for, I like to use the term tribe, but basically my community. Um, A lot of times if I'm around my family, I'm a little bit removed now. Most of my family lives on the East Coast. So I kind of have my little, what I like to call my iron tribe out here of just folks that are in the gym all the time. And that feels like my West Coast family, Um, a mix of friends, coworkers, uh, clientele. I'm fortunate enough to have this community all want to hang out at my gym. So I don't really need to move very much. I just feel like I'm surrounded by friends throughout the entire day. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm I'm very grateful for that. I'm very grateful to have a a job that allows me to have fun every day and be creative every day. And Mm -hmm. it's something that I wake up and I don't really need coffee anymore because I'm so excited Mm -hmm. about going to do what I'm able to do. Um, So I'm in a very fortunate position just in terms of the folks around me and the job that I get to do. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, Do you have any kind of philosophies of wisdoms that you live by um, day, day by day and that, you know, you always kind of get back to when you're maybe feeling down or when, you know, things are starting to feel challenging? Yeah, I've recently uh, read a few books on uh, Eastern philosophy, uh, just looking a little bit of the background of uh, Taoism and Buddhism and Hinduism. And I've just just been curious to learn about these different uh, philosophies and kind of picked pieces that I like to build up my own philosophy and just kind of looked at common denominators. And it seems like one big one is uh, kind of as I alluded to before in terms of routines and this idea of being able to let go of hard attachments. So not having a fixed idea of the way things need to be or not uh, being in a headspace where I want things to be different than the way they are right now, but just taking time to enjoy the way things are. Realizing I have enough, I have everything I need to be happy. Mm -hmm. I can continue to live each day in a feeling like that. I think in the past, I've gone down the path of, uh, this is common in fitness, um, this idea of I'm not, I don't have enough right now. I need to 
do a little bit more to get better. I need to get a little bit stronger. I need to get a little bit leaner. I need a little bit more money. I need a little bit more of this. And I, I kind of get caught in that downward spiral of the not enough mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, again, very, I feel like that's the biggest thing in fitness now is we, it's basically selling that idea to people that you don't have enough. So my biggest wisdom is to tell people that they do have enough and that they are enough. And if you can appreciate who you are right now, then you've earned the right to continue to appreciate the progress that you make along your routines. But if you're not able to be content and happy with the person you are and the resources you have available to you right now, once you get to the next step, you get a little stronger, you get a little bit more, then it's hard to be in a headspace where you can ever appreciate that without continuing to, to look to the next thing. So yeah. long, long story short, that's my, my biggest yeah. piece of wisdom is that, you know, you are enough and you, you are enough to be happy right now. Yeah. I love those. They're really, really powerful. Um, I actually just thought of one <laughs> because um, I've been training with you for a couple of years as well. Um, and one of the things that I constantly still think of um, in my day to day when I'm when I'm having a challenge is what you've always been kind of teaching me was that to be grateful for the challenges that you have in your life as well. And to just say, you know, if, if something is coming your way and you feel like, oh, this is like a really shitty day or this is like something really difficult in my life right now, to not be upset about that and to, you know, to get frustrated about it, but to actually see it as an opportunity and be grateful and thankful for the challenge because that challenge will, you know, help you grow and give you new learnings, um, you know, have new insights and thoughts and um, that you maybe didn't have before. And um, that was, that's something that's definitely been accompanying me um, since, you know, being in touch with you and, and working out with you and training with you. And yeah, I, I think that was, that's been a really powerful one for me too. I think that that learning was mutual. I think when I came out here in, to California and started working with a lot of folks, yourself included, I think my own mindset became much more flexible and much more mm-hmm. uh, growth oriented. I definitely had things that I was a little bit more fixed or more rigid on in the way that I saw things. But just being around folks that are very open-minded and the fact that you guys would openly come to a class knowing that it was going to be hard, I knew there was a lesson in that. I was like, why does she keep coming back and squatting when I keep making them squat? And I, then I started to think, like, that's a pretty good analogy for life. Like a squat, you've got a heavy load that you're intentionally bringing down just so you can overcome and stand up with it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get too – I don't want to get too – No, I love that. Yeah. Too cheesy or cliche, but I think that that's a, a great analogy for a lot of other stressful situations that we encounter in life is – it's an opportunity to overcome it and stand up for them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so do you have any books or maybe one book that you've been reading over and over again or something where you feel like you're picking it up and every time you read it, it's, um, there's something new in there or maybe a book that's changed your life or the way you've been thinking. Yeah. I have two books that these are definitely more on the philosophical end, but they're just full of nuggets that are very applicable to everyday scenarios. Um, one is mindset by Carol Dweck. Um, that's a, that's a book basically discussing what we just talked about, the differences between having a growth mindset and open mindset, mm-hmm. um, strat- pretty useful strategies to start to become aware of ways that you're maybe rigid in the way you're thinking and ways to change your perception in a way where you start th- looking at challenges as opportunities to grow. So mm-hmm. a lot of the wisdom that I shared with you know, my clientele in the past came from that book. So that that's mm-hmm. a huge one. I highly recommend that for anybody that's in a position of teaching. So any coaches, mm-hmm. any parents, any teachers, anybody with management or leadership responsibilities, I think that there's a there's many takeaway nuggets from that book, Mindset by Carol Dweck. Okay. Um, the second one, more philosophical, but that I've learned a lot about my own um, mindset, my own spirituality, uh, a book called Be Here Now by Ram Dass. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a book that I've read a few times now. And every time I go back and read it, uh, I feel like I take away a lot more nuggets of information. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks for sharing those. Um, yeah. there's definitely some in there that I haven't read yet. So I'll, I'll definitely make sure to check them out. Um, so what's next for you? What are you, so you're going home for Christmas and then what's going on for 2020? Do you have any big plans? Yeah. One thing I'm pretty excited about in January is um, going down to Mexico to do a yoga retreat. Okay. And, and uh, that's going to be, I'm pretty interested in um, this idea of leading um, kind of vacation-based experiences for mm-hmm. health and wellness. 
So this is mainly sometimes a little bit of me just trying it out, seeing the process, seeing the logistics, seeing how hard it is to pull this off because it's, it's at a beautiful location on the beach in Mexico. Nice. Um, also a little bit out of my comfort zone with yoga. Um, for the, <laughs> I, I actually uh, com compete in powerlifting, so it's a little bit of the opposite end of the spectrum. But my whole philosophy that I tell folks is we want to find for longevity and health the middle of that spectrum. Um, I like to use the term graceful savages. I, I think a little bit, I sometimes get a little bit too far on the right of too savage and not enough grace. So this is hopefully something that's going to bring me back. But I'm going to learn a lot more uh, tools for my toolbox, um, things that I can immediately come back and start using. Yeah. Wow. That's super fun. And that's really cool. And um, if people are listening now and they're interested to connect with you or learn more about, um, you know, how you train people or what kind of, um, you know, techniques and exercises you recommend people to do, how can they connect with you? Yeah, so I'm happy to give out my personal email. I, I'd love, love to have further conversations with folks and answer any questions. But my personal email is lucasdunham33 at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can, you can include that in the show notes, but just first, first, last name, 33 at gmail.com. Cool. And my, I'm in, I'm on Instagram. Um, so my Instagram handle is L Dunham 33. So just first initial last name, 33. Um, and I can message on there. I'm happy to, to share information on there. Honestly, it's a lot of pictures of my travels and food. So there's not a lot of fitness oriented <laughs> stuff on there, but I'm on there. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions from people. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, Luke, it's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast. I really appreciate your time. And, you know, I think it's kind of sh shown through, um, but you've had a huge, you know, impact on my own life um, over the last couple of years. And I'm certainly very, very happy that we met and that we uh, had the, you know, the possibility to, uh, to train together and to be friends. And yeah, I'm, I'm really appreciative of you. So thank you so much for being here today. <laughs> Likewise, Julia, I think what you're doing is uh, very important for everyone in this, especially in the Bay Area, California, but I think everybody in the corporate setting can benefit from a little bit more uh, content in terms of how to manage stress. It's the biggest uh, roadblock for building routines. It's the biggest roadblock from a physique and health standpoint. So I, I love the awareness that you're bringing to it and the, the real like usable strategies that you're giving your listeners. So thanks. Thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thanks. <laughs>If you enjoyed this episode, I would be extremely happy and grateful if you could leave me a comment and a five-star rating. If you know someone who would benefit from the information I talked about today, please feel free to share it with them. No matter if it is your friends, your colleagues and or your family members. You will always find all links and a summary of the podcast in the show notes. It would be great if we could connect on Instagram or via email. You can find all details of how to find me in the show notes as well. In that way, you can also send me any questions that you might have. And as I mentioned, I also have a wonderful YouTube channel now where you can post comments and questions. So please reach out. I'm glad you're listening to this podcast. Thank you so much for your trust. With gratitude, Julia.